the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. covering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What do you want from me? Well, good morning. good morning. My name is Christopher Weiser. I'm one of the pastors here at First Church, and it is an honor to be delivering the message this morning. We are in the second week of the series, Get Used to Different. And in this series, we're traveling through the Gospel of Mark and finding connections from the hit streaming series, The Chosen. Now, friends, it is kind of funny. When we were talking about um, this series and the Gospel of Mark and integrating the chosen and things of that nature we were like hey what should we name this and so we were thinking of like all the different lines in there and the line that we came up with was obviously get used to different what i discovered though is that there's there was two interpretations of what when jesus said right go figure a bunch of pastors in a room and there's two different interpretations right of jesus saying get used to different in the episode so there was one way and then there was the right way right <laughs> And so the two um, one was with the first one, which is really the most natural and uh, in the end ends up being the actual right way, right? Like get used to difference, just like accepting difference, right? Like Jesus is leading the disciples to a different direction, a different way. And hey, get used to it. Like, like get used to things being changed, being a little bit different around here, right? And then the other way, which is uh, the, 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 so the second way, this, is, this was my way, is I interpret it more as like get used to being, uh, do, or excuse me, doing things differently. Like go do them. Like you are going to be used to do things differently, right? So I don't know. I don't know where my mind was, but that's where it was, right? So um, these two different ways uh, of, of thinking about it, well, I'm preaching, so we're going to be stuck with the second option today, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, and we're going to be looking at this morning, like uh, discovering what happens when we are chosen by Jesus and how that can drive us to get used to do or be different. Um, but when we're going to start off to do this, we're going to start off with a clip from The Chosen that shows the call story of the um, disciple Simon, also known as Peter. But first, let's pray. God, we thank you for bringing us here to get together this day to be able to worship and praise your name. We pray that this morning that you would reveal to us our chosenness and how much you love each and every one of us individually and what that means for our lives. So in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray, amen. Let's check out this clip. <laughs> My brother and the baptizer. <laughs> you are the Lamb of God, yes? I am. Depart from me. I am a sinful man. You don't know who I am and the things I've done. Don't be afraid, Simon. I'm sorry. We, we've waited for you for so long, we believe. But my faith, how sorry. <laughs> Lift up your head, fisherman. <laughs> what do you want from me? Anything you ask, I will do. Follow me. You have much bigger things ahead of you, Simon, son of Jonah. Did you understand that parable I told earlier? 
From now on, I will make you fishers of men. And you are to gather as many as possible, all kinds. I will sort them out later. It is so awesome to see the Gospels come alive in such a, a powerful way and using like video and film. And so uh, what an amazing way to uh, hear and see this um, Gospel story. But the text is also pretty awesome. And so, hey, we're going to take a look from Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. It says this, as Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boats mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired man and followed him. Now, like, this is a really strange story, don't you think? Right? Pastor Candace started off with Mark chapter 1 last week, and she was talking about how that Mark is an announcement of the good news of Jesus Christ, that the Messiah is here and has come to save the world. And then Mark just jumps right into this scene where Jesus walks up to two fishermen and says, hey, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And the crazy thing is, they do it. They drop everything that they're doing, and they follow him. Like, it's kind of strange, isn't it? Like, what would it take for you to have a stranger, like, walk up to you and say, hey, come follow me. We're going to go fish for people. Full stop. What are you talking about here, right? Like, you know, you're going to have questions. You're going to have all kinds of other things. The text is not going to read, I just got up and then followed, right? It's going to be like, we need to talk a little bit about this here right? So it's an incredibly strange story. And Mark doesn't give us a lot of reasons why they drop everything. He doesn't say they were like bored with life or they were just tired of fishing and wanted to do something different. Um, they just do so. And so for Mark, it is important. Like I think what he's trying to share is that it's important to have a willingness to drop it all for God, to stop one way of life and to turn into another way. Now, what's interesting in this story is like some, um, some translations of Jesus' words here add come in front of follow me. So it says, come, follow me. And some don't. Some just say follow me as, as what we showed here. A more precise rendering here would be like here behind me. The Greek kind of has the suggestion of authority, right? Like here behind me. It's kind of like, you're tr maybe, maybe uh, like a good comparison would be like when I, say, when I need CJ to follow me, I say, CJ, here, behind me. I need you here, right? Like we're going across the street. This is going to be a little dangerous. I need you right here so that you can then see and learn how to navigate this world, how to navigate this street perhaps, right? But it's also like reminiscent. Remember, man, the Bible is so interconnected. What we read in the New Testament connects to the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. And so it's also like reminiscent of these times where God calls, for instance, Abraham to go to a new land, like drop it all, go this new direction. Or when God calls a prophet like Isaiah, right? And uh, so it gives Isaiah like this message before he didn't have a message. And then after, after he has this amazing encounter with God where he goes, holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Like he then has this like message to go and proclaim to the people. Or perhaps this is a little similar to when Elijah calls Elisha, right? Where Elijah's like, hey, throws a cloak over him. It's like, you're going with me. We're, we're going to go do what God called us to do and wants to move at that instant. Drop it all and let's go a different directions. Well, in the same way, God calls you. You are chosen by God. Jesus says to you today, here behind me, come follow me. Don't, don't wait till tomorrow, right? Like today is the time, like now is the moment. Which then leads us to a very important question. Follow to where, <laughs> right? Where are we going, right? Like, where's Simon going? Where do you want us to go? Like, why? Can you give us just a little bit more? To which, as we remember, right, Jesus replies, fish for people. 
And if you're like me, you're like, what is going on in this story? Like, this, is, this almost makes no sense. Fishing for people? What is, what is Mark getting at here? What is he perhaps alluding to? And the answer is he's calling forth, and so does Matthew and Luke, uh, they're calling forth some important prophecies. They're pointing to, hey, there's some things that, were, that God said were going to happen. Oh, and they're happening right now now and jesus is enacting them you're like whoa so what's a prophecy well a prophecy is simply a message from god it's usually a message for god that says hey you're going this direction and i'm just gonna tell you straight up if you keep going there it is no good like like most of the prophecies in the bible when you go and read them you're like man this is really tough reading maybe god seems upset like this is the end state is not good like it seems this is like really hard to digest because they are huge warning like you got to think what 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 is needed to get god to intervene and say hey by the way over here don't go this way this is a highway. There's too much traffic. You're not running across this road. That is not wise. And if you do, you might be like Frogger. You might miss like the first car. You might miss the second car. But I'm telling you, one of the cars are going to catch you, right? And so these prophecies are announcements, messages of God saying, hey, there's some things going on. And if you keep going this direction, it's going to not be okay. Now, sometimes we think of prophecies as being future-telling, right? Like, oh, you're just predicting the future, like this will happen, and then it comes. Well, they get that reputation because the things that sometimes when God says, hey, don't do that, or this is going to happen, it's going to be really bad, they kept on doing it, and the bad really happened. So it's not as much about telling the future because you have a choice. The message has, well, that would be just mean to give a message out to somewhere and you couldn't even change or do anything about it, right? Like, that's no, that doesn't help anybody. You might as well just be quiet. The whole point of the message is to create a change, give a new direction. And so there's a couple prophecies that once we read them, we go, oh, interesting. These Old Testament passages relate to the New Testament of what Jesus is doing there. So first one, Jeremiah 16, 16, it says this, I am now sending for many fishermen says the Lord, and they shall catch them. And afterward, I will send them, send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill out of the clefts of the rock. God's going to send people to go find God's chosen people and to bring them back, right? Like to go catch them like a fisherman catches fish. Um, and then in Amos uh, 4, 2, it says, the Lord has sworn by his holiness, like God's like, I promise this is happening. The time is surely coming upon you when they shall take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish hooks. It's like, hey, I know you're not listening to me, but eventually I'm going to get so real with you that I'm going to grab you by a fish hook and pull you along, right? Like these are some serious, serious prophecies, um, they allude to like this time when God is going to put an end to our inclinations to hurt each other or to worship other gods or perhaps having poor stewardships of the gifts of God. And this connects with that announcement that was talked about last week, right? Like the world is changing. God is coming. Clear away for God. Clear away because God is here at work. And so the prophets were sent to help us see what God wants us to see, to change what God wants us to change. They announce this message. And so too do we find ourselves sometimes living a life and like caught up in the ways of the world, right? Like we become almost just like everybody else. We don't realize it. We don't realize how much um, hurt that we sometimes contribute to. We don't realize sometimes... Um, so how we contribute perhaps to injustice or are hurting other people in the, in the simplest sense, right? Hurting other people or perhaps even, you know, ignoring or walking away from God. Like we sometimes don't, don't recognize this. And so sometimes like a message is kind of proclaimed. It's sent to kind of, hey, come back. Remember, remember the God who loves you. And when we first encounter these kinds of messages, sometimes, right, it hurts, like there's this, this, this tinge, we feel this kind of guilt, or perhaps the word, the word that we like to use um, in, in, in the church is the sense of conviction. 
So let me give you a little example that um, at least those who lived through the 90s may remember, right? So in the 90s, there was these big campaigns that started to, to, to go along about um, stewardship of the earth, right? Like taking care of the earth and against littering. They had TV shows for kids like Captain Planet and all kinds of other things, right? But one thing that kind of left an impression was this picture of a, of a turtle that had like those plastic... Um, the plastic six pack, right? So the, like the soda cans, I'm already seeing some heads. They remember this, right? Like you, you see the, 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 the little plastic wrapper and it was on the neck of like this animal. And like everybody was like, oh, this is horrible. Like I feel so bad. Like we can't do this. And so everybody started to cut the six pack wrapper so that when it got in the trash, if it, for whatever reason, ended up where it should not be, it wouldn't at least hurt the animals in that way, right? There was a sense of conviction that led to some changes in behavior. And to this day, there are still people that. Perhaps maybe a more modern example would probably be like the straws, right? Like we saw the straws that were hurt, that, that an animal got hurt by. Um, but these, uh, these moments where we kind of recognize, perhaps, I mean, imagine if, if, just imagine for a minute if that was your, literally, like you could find, you wrote your name on, I don't know why, but you wrote your name on that six pack. Um, wrapper and it was literally yours around the neck of that animal right like you would feel so bad especially in things like the proximity of it right like whoa and so sometimes when we recognize something that maybe went wrong and and you can use your own illustration that one doesn't work well think of your own right like um where we feel guilty or convicted when we realize man we're just i'm just off the mark on this like, I didn't mean to hurt my friend on, in this way. I didn't, I didn't mean to say those words to my family members. I didn't even realize that those words even were the ones that were going to hurt that person. Like, I didn't even intentionally do this. This was completely incidental. Sometimes we can feel it. Sometimes we just did it. We just did wrong, and we did hurt somebody. Maybe we were mad, and it was intentional, right? But in the same way, we feel this kind of conviction, and this conviction can feel like um, a, a fish being caught in a net or hooked on a line. Like, I imagine this is not a very fun experience, right? And so God sometimes works in our lives in this way. And it is, in our point of view, it is a work of grace. Like, to have our eyes opened to the evil and brokenness um, that's all around us or that's in our own lives, like, this, it is convicting. We call this like a convicting grace because it's a good thing first we're awakened to this hurt and brokenness it's a grace and when we're awakened right then we can go and do something about it and god's a good god god is with us in that doing something about it like we're not just stuck in this kind of conviction or this guilt or perhaps shame right like there's a movement forward and out of it that is only a moment and so for clarity there are sometimes people who um, this is where they kind of get stuck to, and then this is all they kind of share about God. It's like this kind of guilting, shaming, fearing, kind of always about convicting, always trying to make people kind of feel bad. And that's, that's, that's not right. That's not what it's about, right? Like that happens when you sometimes encounter like perfect love, and you recognize, oh, okay, wow, I see it now. I need to go into like this different direction. And boy, man, I feel really bad because I maybe made a few mistakes and that may have hurt you, God, may have hurt other people. Like, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. But we are healed and restored so that we can then go do something about it. God's convicting grace never leads us to despair. Never leads us to despair. We may feel off balance. We may be convicted for a time. But that is not where we are to live. And so we saw in this clip, right, right, like, like the chosen, this little video clip, right? And it kind of reflects a little bit more of the gospel of Luke. It gives us some more details on this encounter. And so when Jesus and, and, and Simon meet on that beachside, right, Simon is broken. He's just like, man, Jesus, you got to go. You got to get away from me. Like you just performed this like little miracle. I needed all these fish. Like, uh, you got to go. I am a sinful person. I'm not good enough for you. He had already heard that proclamation, that announcement of the good news of Jesus Christ. He already heard about this Messiah coming from John the Baptist and Andrew. Now he's connected all the dots, and he's like, I am just not good enough. I'm convicted. 
And Jesus says to him, says to us, but says to him too, right? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. Jesus is like, wait a minute, Simon. I already knew who you were. When I asked you, come follow me, I'm like, I'm Jesus. I'm God. Like, I already know who you are. If I didn't want to call you, I wouldn't have called you at all. Don't be afraid. Let's get to the mission now. Let's move forward. Jesus does not want Simon to be stuck in fear, guilt, and shame because of his failures or sins, but to be redeemed and healed so that he can be then sent to fish for people, right? Like, Jesus does not want you to be stuck in your fear, guilt, or shame for any failures or sins that you may have, but to be redeemed so that, and healed so that you can then be, go, be sent out to go and fish for people, and Jesus is going to teach them how to bring people into the family of God by showing them who God is because Jesus is God. And Jesus is willing to teach you how to bring people into the family of God because, because by, God, by showing us who God is because Jesus is God. And that's how Jesus wants us to bring people in the family of God, by the way. We fish for people by showing people who God is like in our lives. And so this morning, you're like, okay, I'm with you on this. Like, I'm following Jesus, or maybe I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm willing to maybe get used to do things differently, <laughs> right? Um, like, what can this look like? What do, what do you mean here, uh, Christopher? How can, we, how, can we, how can we go in this new direction a little bit? Maybe fast forward the story. And so uh, how can we help people know the love of God and find a home here at First Church? I'm going to show out two ways, two ways. First... We can love as Jesus loved. In 1 John 4, uh, 7 through 9, it says this, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. We love because God first loved us. If we have God's love in us, then we, are, uh, we will be loving people. There's no doubt about it. Everything that we do comes from this love in our lives. And friends, this love baffles the followers of Jesus over and over. And if we're honest with ourselves, it baffles us too because Jesus is found loving the absolutely unlovable people and forgiving people whom we will have a hard time forgiving, who the disciples were like, I don't think so, friend. It baffles them. The disciples want to overthrow the Romans. They want to ensure that people are following the rules right. They want prestige. They want respect. They want gifts. They want power. They want authority right? And we, we're just like them. We want the same thing. We want our ideas to be the way things are. If they only listen to me, we want prestige. We want power. All with good intentions, right? All with good intentions. Yet Jesus modeled a different path. And our path is sacrificial love. We go and love people where they're at, wherever they're at. And so here's the question for you. Who could you love this week? Who could you love this week? Second, we listen as Jesus listens. Jesus listens to people. God listens to you. When you pray, God listens to you. That's, that's, a, that's a characteristic of who God is. God cares. And so in the Gospels, we see Jesus listening to people. We see Jesus listening to them and debating. You, gotta be able to you have to listen to someone to be able to respond, right? We see that Jesus change his mind because of what people share with him. We see him answer questions that people have. Like his listening presence in people's lives mood people to change their lives, to go into like totally new directions. I have a question for you. Have you ever felt like you weren't heard? right? Like the person heard your words, but they weren't actually listening. It's kind of frustrating, right? And I'm going to be honest right now, right? Like 
I can be one of the worst offenders. My wife, Christina, is not here right now, luckily, so she gave me a face last night, but it's like, I can be one of the worst offenders, right? Somebody can be talking to me, and I might be talking to somebody else at the same time, right? And uh, doing all kinds of other things other than actually listening to the person in front of you. And so, hey, I just want to say, this is one of, the, one of the best gifts, one of the best gifts that we can give someone is listening with non-judgment and not trying to solve the problem. I mean, if they ask you to help and give input, great. But sometimes, most of the time, I feel like people just want to be heard, like really heard. And they want you to understand who they are. And I'm going to tell you, that takes a lot of focus and a lot of work and a lot of love. For that other person. And so who, who can you really listen to this week? God really listens to you. Who can you go and listen to this week? I want to share like, it's always, it's always powerful when you when you hear like stories of God already at work after, after a message. And so last night it was shared with me after this, like somebody, um, somebody had shared with me like, you know, after I heard this, I thought of this person who hasn't been in our community for a while, right? And they can't be here because they just don't have the, the transportation, like the means to get here. And it was just so beautiful that they had thought of this person who couldn't be here um, whom we love so very, very much and who wants to be here as well. And they said, you know what? I'm going to reach out to them this week and I'm going to find a way to be able to bring them so they can come and worship and be a part of this community. And I'm like, that's it. That's it right there, right? Like that's what God want, calls us to do is to think of these creative ways of, of, of how we can go and love and connect with other people, to be in service to other people, to love them and listen to them. And friends, like, I, you know, I don't know where you are, like, this morning, right? Perhaps, uh, maybe all of this seems like a lot, and you're like, oh, my goodness, there's so much going on here, so many things in my mind. But I just want to say this. I want you to walk away with this. You are chosen. You are chosen to be loved by God. You are chosen to be forgiven by God. You are chosen to be healed by God. You are chosen to be empowered by God. You are chosen to do different things. You are chosen to fish for people. And so I'd like to end with these words from, the, uh, from, a, from a classic hymn called Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. And it's based on this encounter of Jesus and the disciples. It says this, in simple trust, like theirs who heard beside the Syrian sea, the gracious calling of the Lord, let us, like them, without a word, rise up and follow thee. May we rise up and follow Jesus wherever he may lead us. Amen. Let us pray. God, would you... Would you bring your message into our lives? Would you show us the direction that you are calling us to go? And, and God, that may, that may sting a little bit, and we're going to accept that sting, but God, we're not going to live there. We're not going to live under guilt or shame or conviction. We are going to move forward into fishing for people, into loving you, loving ourselves, and loving people with all of our hearts, minds, and souls. God, we will follow. Will you lead us? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.